Hi, Stephen. Thanks for joining us on the Commercial Property Investor Podcast. Really appreciate your time today. Um, we're just going to quickly go through um, your journey so far. So thanks for joining us, Stephen. Thanks for having me, Jerry. Good to be here. Yeah, appreciate that. <laughs> um, for those that are listening, um, Stephen and I have been working together for a bit over the last, uh, what, five months, Stephen, something like that, yeah. around about that. Um, and Stephen's been investing in commercial as a really interesting project. So I thought it would just be a great opportunity to have a chat on the podcast about that project and what you've learned and some of the things that um, you've got for the future. So just before we get stuck into the actual building specifics, Stephen, can you just tell us a little bit about your background? Just a wee intro as, as to who you are and why on earth you decided to get involved in commercial property. Sure. Okay. So I, uh, like many people, had a, a bit of a change in my life over the last couple of years due to the global pandemic. And prior to COVID, I was working as an operations director for a fairly successful restaurant company. We had four restaurants across Scotland, three in Edinburgh, one in Aberdeen, and I employed over 100 staff in that role. And that ran for eight years. We built a business up, quite a good successful stage. And then right at the point where it was peaking, COVID came along and took the, took the, took the feet from underneath us. And it became apparent towards the middle end of 2020 that, um, my role was not really going to be required in the way that it had once been. So I, uh, I accepted redundancy last November and I had already been looking um, for potential opportunities beyond that. You know, seeing the writing on the wall, you might, you might say. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, um, we looked at a few business opportunities, actually, and I decided that it was time to leave hospitality behind. I think hospitality has got a, a long and difficult road back. Um, but when there's churn, as there has been in COVID and the GFC before that, there are always opportunities. And something that I'd always worked in previously was residential development um, and management of property. So property caught my interest, but I realised that to get cash flow, it was probably going to have to be commercial as opposed to residential, which is something that I had never done before. But that was the start of a quite exciting journey, I suppose. Yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, a real troublesome time in hospitality. And it must must have been a bit of a challenge to be able to let that go. Or did the fact that, you know, things dragged on for so long, did you kind of come accustomed to that? Did you accept that? We fought it hard for the first six months during the initial lockdown and after, because the first and most important thing was to make sure that the business could navigate its way through the, uh, the, the pandemic. We didn't obviously have... Uh, far sight to see how long it was going to last but by the time August of last year turned into September and social distancing really bit hard and um, we still had a lot of staff in furlough I had to make a lot of staff redundant it, it became apparent that it was going to it potentially take years for many businesses to get back on their feet it was time yeah. to go look for something else and I'm delighted to say that the business has managed to sustain itself and I, I very much hope that they get back on their feet and I'm sure they are doing so now um, but yeah, it's not 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 quite through yet. Yeah, it's it's not, is it? It's still going to wash through, and and there's a lot of businesses out there that I guess if there's any anything else that comes along, they 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 may that may be the last nail. But you know, uh, along comes opportunity at the same time, doesn't it? So why did you actually? Why was commercial property something you thought would be good for cash flow and stuff and rather than necessarily because you obviously got a really good background in operations and running businesses successfully and commercial gives different things what why why did you decide to do that it didn't commercial didn't phase me and one of the reasons I think with hindsight was that when you are running restaurants, you're already running a commercial enterprise. There's commercial premises there which require a lot of the boxes to be ticked in the same way as commercial um, office space or workspace does. So you need to have all your licenses in place and your liabilities for the people who are coming on site. That aspect um, was something that I already had in my locker. Then looking beyond and trying to trying to work out how people were going to behave and the changes in behavior of people in the work environment post COVID. 
I started to form an opinion that a lot of city centres were going to be not quite as in demand for large employers as perhaps they had once been. And it, it occurred to me that regional space might be a good place to invest um, because people were already enjoying working from home. Whether that remains the case, I'm not sure. But at that time, people had realised po possibly that the commute is not going to be as the be-all and end-all that, that it once was. So it putting two and two together, I felt I've got a bit of commercial nous and I've got a bit of property experience. And this has happened, presenting an opportunity. Let's go and look for workspace in regional locations outside of large conurbations. And that's what brought me to Dunfermline. Brilliant. Okay, so let, let's let's talk a bit about the project, and and just before we dive into the project, what what led you to this building? How did you find it? I, I, when did we first start talking? Was it last summer, summer well, twenty twenty? Yeah. So when I when I decided that this was something I was definitely serious about looking at, I started researching online, and I happened to come across the Commercial Property Investors podcast, which I listened to, consumed, um, and at that point. We didn't know each other and i also had no understanding that you were based relatively local to us so uh, that, that was a surprise but a pleasant one so before we actually met this property had kind of fallen into my lap so i was looking around in tayside and fife for an initial project which was not going to be, be scary because it was so large it was going to allow me to make the mistakes that were inevitably going to happen, but also had the potential to produce cash flow. And it was interesting because this property came available. It was being sold with VP. Um, it was between lockdown one and two. There probably wasn't a great deal of activity going on. The value of the property was kind of underpinned by a uh, resi potential fallback. So it wasn't the cheapest building to buy, but on the upside, it was in very good condition and it required minimal conversion cost to get it operational and that was appealing and just as a little aside i took a senior surveyor friend of mine along to see it valuation uh, guy and uh, he came out and laid it down on the line for me he said if you can't make this work you can't make anything work so just get <laughs> which i thought was great encouragement yeah, great encouragement. So that that that, that kind of gave me put me under a bit of pressure. But joking aside, it it wasn't one that I had to scratch under the surface too hard to get. It had come on the market, but there wasn't much activity at that point. And we were heading into the second lockdown at the time. So and it was also becoming close to Christmas, and there didn't seem to be a lot of activity, um, which gave me a lot of um, gave me a lot of encouragement actually to go and uh, negotiate hard to get a good deal. Which you did. You did get a. You did get the price down. I, like you say, it's a little bit about timing, isn't it? You know, and when these projects come up and when you make those decisions. But ultimately, you had done some background. You knew what you were looking for. You knew the area you were looking for. So, although it did drop in your lap, as you say, actually, there was a bit of background work first to, to understand whether it was a good deal or not. There was, and I think you know. That's a very good point, is that the, the harder you work, the luckier you become, right? It's the old Gary Player thing. Yeah. So, the the you know, we had scratched under the surface, done a lot of groundwork, done a lot of competitive analysis across central Scotland to see what was out there in terms of um, a serviced off offering, because by this stage, I'm kind of thinking I want it to be a serviced uh, offering. I don't want to do FRI leases. I want flexibility and bringing my hospitality experience into play. I wanted it to have an element of customer service. Yeah. Um, and, and as a very young man, I worked overseas in the States and did some college programs in America. And the thing they kept on coming back to was exceeding customer expectation. And that's something that I've always aimed to do in the industry and something that I felt I could bring to a commercial uh, office or commercial workspace environment also. Yeah, brilliant. So. You said you part hospitality, but really it runs through everything that you're trying to do in this project, isn't it? Uh, you know, making customers feel they're they're welcome. They're you have an interest in them. That because hospitality isn't just food and beverage, is it? It's it's the whole experience. Absolutely, it's about adding value. It's about uh, you know exceeding that exceeding expectation, making sure that people 
feel comfortable in the environment in which they're coming to and that they want to come back because obviously that's going to increase stickiness which is going to um, ensure hopefully decent occupancy down the line so yeah uh, we'll always be looking to improve the experience for the customer great so let's talk about the project so can you just briefly tell us um about the building so obviously it, i say obviously it's it's an old building um really quite a, a a beautiful building there's some great features in it can you maybe just tell us about the process and and what kind of size it is what sure. it has developed into Stephen? yeah so it was a it was an office already so we didn't have to change any any um class it was built in 1897 with a net internal of two and a half thousand square feet there's quite a lot of passageway and large hallways and so on so the gross internal is actually almost four thousand which is it's quite big and there's a big attic as well which is as yet undeveloped um there are 11 internal apartments inside the building um we only had to put one stud wall up to create an extra office um which was um stolen from the lower hallway so if you can imagine a uh, sort of it looks late victorian but with Two pillars out the front and it's got a gorgeous entrance with a big storm door and nice vestibule lower hallway and then office spaces inside or workspaces as we now prefer to refer to them um, accommodating between two and six people per room so it's a small project um, to get started but it was enough to learn from and um yeah, we, 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 we managed to turn the building around in eight weeks, actually, from getting the keys to opening the doors for business, which was quite fast. Yeah, it was fantastic to see that. Um, and, you know, for those of us who have been in the industry for a while, that sometimes take a bit longer to do projects. It was it was in, um, a good kick <laughs> to say, get a building, eight weeks, get it turned around. And then you had this building that was empty, but ready to go. Um, how did you feel at that moment? Well, terrified and excited at the same time. So <laughs> you get to the stage where you you can only deal with what's right in front of you. And it was just me in the business. So I had a um, very busy time turning the building around. My wife helped with the interiors. She did a great job. Um, but really, apart from that, it was getting some trades in, spending as little as possible to make the place look as good as possible, furnishing it calling on friends and family to come and take their drills and get tables put together and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden, we've got a building that's finished, small snagging list, and no customers. Yeah, and the, thing, and, and the thing, of course, is that you, when when all that activity is going on, it to, you can allow it to distract you from the inevitable, which is actually I'm going to have to find some customers. You're kind of in this little bubble of, well, I'm doing work, I'm being busy, but actually at some point, you know deep down the, the rubber is going to meet the road and I need to actually find out whether any customers want this space. Absolutely. <laughs> and you got um, to that point. We did get to that point. And that's something that I have learned is that if when we get through the next project, I need to be at least one step back from it in order to be developing a marketing strategy and getting it out there, which is, you know, it's a critical part of the whole, the whole project is the customer and letting them know that you're there letting them know what you do, how you can help them solve their problems in terms of finding space in which to work. And um, I had this beautiful shiny building. Nobody knew where it was. There was no SEO on the website and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, we live and learn. So let's let's just talk about finding customers, right, for the audience here, because, you know, you've got this splendid shiny building, which people can do, of course, get to that stage. But rubber meets the road. How did you find the customers? Have you found any customers? What stage is the project at now in terms of occupancy? Well, when we opened the doors, Jerry, it's quite interesting. I think we were slightly ahead of the curve for a new building, a new business um, offering space because we really only had come out of lockdown a few weeks prior and people were still maybe deciding what they were going to do in terms of returning to the workplace, whether they were discussing with their employers or um, possibly starting out on their own or looking, they've been working from home and now they're needing to get out of the house. So it took a while from that perspective for people to make their minds up. But most importantly is to get out there and let people know that you exist. So without any photography 
Um, we had to just be quite creative. Uh, we did a lot of social media promotion. We did paid Facebook advertising, for example, which was relatively successful. We made sure that we were very present as, as soon as possible on Google so that people could find us and that we could tell them about the services that we provide because it's such a critical route to market, right? So that 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 took a bit of time, but you know, we got there in the end. And we did some Insta posts as well. And then beyond that, it was about really trying to get out to the local business community, which I think is critical. So communicating as much as possible with people who might be either looking for space or people who know people who are looking for space. So people in the property industry, um, people in the legal fraternity, professionals, um, business clubs, networking groups, uh, local, I mean, Facebook is, is a fantastic source. I mean, there's a, there are a few fantastic local Facebook groups that you can you can get involved with and really just try and integrate yourself into the local local community, wherever you might be. Sounds like a full time job, Stephen. <laughs> let's just put let's just put a time frame around this. So you go so you go from zero. Um, what date? When did you open the doors? Because now we're in um, August, mid mid August. When yeah. when did you open the doors? Uh, June first, we opened the doors. Okay, so what's occupancy like now? So we are one hundred percent occupied. Well done. Um, and yeah so when 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 did the last customer take space or your last deal go through the last deal was signed a week and a half ago so okay. just at the start just at the start of august so that took that actually took eight weeks to get to um, to get to full occupancy well done that's fantastic yeah. And th this building is small, right? You mentioned there about size, 2,000 two, two or 2,500 net? 2,500 net. 2,500 net. So it's not it's not insignificant. And, and as we mentioned, you know, it is a very nice Victorian building. But in terms of serviced office space, which is effectively your offer, it, it is relatively small. Um, but there's some benefits to that, aren't there? And there's also, I guess, some limitations. So maybe you could just talk through some of the logic there about taking on that particular project, the size. You were very much aware of the size and, and its potential for making money, but also some of the – those are the limitations, but also some of the benefits of having that. Can you maybe just go through the, the logic sure. there? Something that resonated massively with me when I was doing my research was that everyone that I listened to, yourself included, and, and others that have been on um, – on your podcast and Clubhouse and, and, and other books that I've read and so on, they've all said start small because there are going to be mistakes made along the way. And, you know, it's been a real learning curve for me. It's been fantastic. So I was kind of thinking that um, although I had access to JV Finance and submission of business plans and, and I'd managed to secure that aspect, I didn't want to go buying 10,000 square feet as my first project because if it required massive refurb cost, there's a propensity for it to go wrong and you could end up running out of cash before you get going. With this project, it required minimal refurb. Um, the electrics were good, the gas was good, the cat the cat five was was excellent. There was fantastic connectivity in its own cabinet in in-house. It was really well located in front of a 120 space car park in central Dunfermline. So it ticked a lot of boxes, early doors. And with only eleven offices, I'm thinking, I'm sure I can get them let. And I felt confident about that. The downside, I suppose, is that the space is almost too small for some potential customers. So if someone's needing um, 10 desks in a room, for example, I can't service that. So I'm, I'm cut off from a sector of the market that I otherwise would be open to. No point in bringing my great service and fantastic space if it can't fit you in, right? So that's a downside. And the other downside, I suppose, although it's also a benefit, is its location in that being in central Dunfermline, we're less than 10 minutes walk from the train station, for example, but there's no free parking. That's that's a downside, without a doubt. And that's put some customers off, unfortunately, but it's, um, it's also attracted some customers because if they live locally, they can cycle into work, park their, park their bike and walk into the office. Um, or they can walk up to the high street and you know, to Marquis for a sandwich at lunchtime, if they so wish. So, you know, there are pros and cons, but overriding 
um, all of that, I think, was that it was a great building. It was in good nick. It wasn't too large, but it was still able to help me develop the brand. Yeah, and and start and test. It's interesting you talk about parking, just going off on a side route for a second. Some people think that that, that is you know, a deal killer, there's no parking, customers are not going to get any space, but the reality is you've still got 100% occupied. Yeah. So there are some customers that that need parking, and that's fine, and maybe you can't provide it, but ultimately um, it's about filling the building, isn't it? So if, if you can't please everybody, I guess is the point, and, you know, some people, that then parking is not necessarily their main issue. So, I mean, I sometimes get people contacting me and saying, well, look, I'm looking at this property, but it's only got two parking spaces. Do you think it's worth looking at? Well, it may switch off to some customers, but it certainly doesn't mean it's not going to work as a building. Do you think, for instance, a building in the central business district in London or Perth or Australia or whatever has umpteen parking spaces? Of course it doesn't. You know, it's not always a guaranteed expectation of customers. Anyway, um, so the building's finished. We've got some bums on seats. We've got some clients in there. I know you've got some things there you could improve as time goes on, you know, just through um, perhaps adding some more services, new customers coming in, all, all that lovely stuff that'll take a bit of time. But, but we're already talking about a new project. I guess you've obviously learned quite a lot from this deal. You've learned um it's not put you off <laughs> no nope. and, and and now you're out looking for something else so what things has that project taught that you're now taking on for the next one what is there anything different to what you're going to do next it's given me a lot of confidence actually that um despite all the challenges that are put in front of you in commercial property you can still succeed and a lot of it is fugazi right i mean you, you can break through a lot of the stuff if you just have a decent product and, and I think if you know your market, which is obviously critically important. So moving forward now, we want to, um, well, I'm, I'm at stage, which which I, I, I probably didn't go enough credence to at the time because I was so focused on getting number one up and running. But what we've got to do is then we've got to, we've got to re, rezone that first project, uh, which ultimately is going to mean refinancing because I'm, I'm working with JV Finance at the moment need to get that onto commercial rate which we're working we're starting to work towards now even though it's early days and we want to go out and get a second site which is going to be a game changer because i don't think there'll ever be a bigger change um, in a business that's growing than going from one to two sites it's going to be far more um onerous than going from eight to nine i think so getting multi-site means i'm going to have to have some staff on board which will be um, which will be great, and it's going to allow me to take a little bit of a step back and help to develop the business. So we're now looking for a larger site, which will, um, I've got my own tick list of, of what I would like, um, and if we can get maybe something up to around 10,000 square feet, I think that would be a good, good second project, uh, which hopefully will allow us to grow the business without busting the, busting the cash flow. Brilliant. Okay. And in terms of geography, Stephen, what sort of distance are you looking away? Are you keeping it local? Yeah. Are, you, are you looking quite far and wide? Well, we're in Perthshire ourselves and uh, Dunfermline's not that far away for a first sight. Everything else that we do is, I've decided it's got to be within maximum one hour and I can't see me crossing the fourth. So I think we're probably either looking at Fife or Tayside uh, yeah. for number two. Tayside's an interesting market purely because Dundee is, is, is on the app and it's doing so well um, and it's close to home. So we'll have to line up multiple opportunities and see which one looks best. Okay. Yeah, that's roughly where we're looking at the moment. Brilliant. Okay. So you did mention finance. It would be remiss of us not to go into that. You've had a joint venture partner that's helped you with this. So you haven't gone to the traditional bank. You've gone with your credibility and your charm and you've managed to secure some JV finance where basically you've, you've got in um, a loan secured on the property to be able to get this get this show on the road but ultimately there is a an exit there that's what you're working on just now isn't it and just in terms of the property because it, you mentioned VP which is vacant possession value when you bought it and obviously now it's got an income it's very early days we need to get some more track record there but what do you think the 
not the number, but the percentage uplift on the building value will be? Is, have you got a sort of a number in mind of what you think that might be? Yeah, so we'll probably increase the value of the building um, by about, well, we, we, we bought it at uh, 280. Yeah. Um, ultimately, we think that it should value somewhere around 450 by the time yeah. we have proven the revenue stream. Um, these figures are quite, you know, that, that could go either way. Um, I hopefully, we'd like to get a bit more out of it. Um, the plan then is to flip it onto commercial mortgage. And we're looking at rates, and it will depend on how the market sees our product. There is a bit of hesitancy, I think, about serviced office uh, revenue in terms of license to occupy versus FRI, traditional three or five year lease revenue. So that's something that we're working through just now. But I think that, as with all these things, if you work hard enough, you'll be able to achieve your goal. And people saying no, it's um, it's not really a... It's not really Please a, try again. Down tools and go home. You know, we just have to work harder. So yeah. I'm, I'm sure that we'll get there in the end. If we can get to valuation of around 500, then um, we'd be very happy indeed in terms of flipping it onto commercial, getting the JV out of the picture and moving on to project two, which hopefully the JV will come along with. Great. Fantastic. So just a bit, while you were um, going through the deal process of, you know, you found this project, you're looking at it all, but at some point you have to make a decision, right, this is the one. How, how did you feel up to the moment of signing the missives or doing the deal? And then how did you feel after it? Did you feel um, all sorts of different excitement, well, trepidation, or were you just like, oh, I know what I'm doing here. I'm just going to get this deal done. I think on the upside, the the fact that the, the building had a resi fallback meant that it mm. was fairly fail safe. And as with the, as as with any transaction, you, you need to take advice from people who know um, and have been there in the past. So, you know, having the benefit of a good team there to to to, to quiz was was obviously very helpful. And um, I had a really good solicitor who's very experienced in comprop, and a couple of severe friends who were really helpful. I also drew in your experience, and and you were very helpful also. So, you know, you've got to put all that together and then really analyze the market and know that you're giving it your best shot. Otherwise, you know, you could fall down. But I think by the time we signed on the dotted line, I was fairly confident that I was going to be able to rent this space. Good. And, and obviously so, that, was, that, was, that was critical. That's a critical part of the, the whole yeah, operation. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> So bear in mind that, as, as you know, Stephen, this podcast is about helping people move from resi into commercial. And, and, and for those that are listening that are maybe just starting out, what, what kind of tips would you give them now? You've been through this process mm -hmm. for, I, I just, because I, some people are, are cautious. Some of them are a bit more gung-ho. Some of them don't quite know where. They've got more of a scattergun approach. You know, people do come at this from different places. But just based on your experience, what, what tips would you give to people just getting started? Well, the first thing I'd say is not to be um, not to be phased by the commercial aspect as opposed to resi, because there are loads of comparisons. You know, at the end of the day, you've got to find um, you've got to find a product that you're going to be able to take to market, whether it's a whether it's a three bed flat in the West End of Glasgow or, you know, a, a, a 20,000 square feet in, in the heart of Sydney, you still have to find a product that you're going to be able to take, take to market. So the first thing I would say is know the market, know your customers, potential customers, know what the competition is, know what's achievable, um, understand how you're going to you know, develop that 360 understanding of the, of the business, whether it's the, the competition, your achievable revenue, the pros and cons of each site, and really do your homework. And a lot of that can be done at your desk, and some of it will have to be done by putting shoe leather on the ground and walking around, talking to agents, meeting people in the industry. And you'll always get gems by by asking. I don't think there's any such thing as a daft question. So, you know, really thoroughly research, I think, would be the, the, the number one thing. And I've learned every day has been a learning curve on this. So that, that, that's number one. Number two, I would say, would probably be to integrate with the local business community to really make sure that you've got good visibility above the line about um, who you are, you know, what you're bringing to market in terms of the product 
and um, to make sure that people will consider you when when a need for space becomes available. So don't and don't be a shy bear, and then you can't be a shy bear, and you've got to get out there. <laughs> and one of the tell you one of the just as an aside, one of the really interesting things I've 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 learned is not to use the word office, because when I opened the doors, one of the things I was expecting was to get some you know consulting engineers and some new start um, maybe you know chartered accountants and you know maybe some technical drawers and stuff coming in. None of that's happened. It's, it's been a breadth of industry that's come through the door looking for space that's taken my breath away and the local business community in Fife has been absolutely amazing you know there are the, the the range of operations that are looking for space is incredible so using the word office was a, my mistake but we don't use it anymore we use workspaces as our as our sort of strap line so that that's been very interesting the last thing I was going to say was just to ensure a good support team um, someone that you can bounce ideas off, whether they are um, legal or whether they're in the surveying community or indeed whether they're in the market that you bring into, is just to um, really in integrate and ingratiate yourself into the commercial business community because you get a lot of help. And I learned a lot through listening to podcasts, but also through joining platforms like Clubhouse. And um, people are ready to share um their experiences which is fantastic and has really given me a lot of confidence so yeah those are a few things that would be worth bearing in mind as you head forth great thanks Stephen. and i'm gonna have to ask you another question which some people can answer straight away um and others take a little bit of time to think about it but i, I got a feeling you know exactly the answer to this and it's basically why are you doing this so what what is your end goal what, what have you what have you got into this um, sticky world for? <laughs> well, ultimately, I, I I'm in it to um, without gosh, I'm in it to buy myself time. I suppose I'm in it to create cash flow to a point where I can buy myself time. Yeah. And the more we can get um, numbers wise on the board in terms of square foot let then the more time I'm going to be able to buy myself. But the other interesting aside is that it's 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 really dynamic. I mean, I've met lots of people. I, I like all of my customers, which is lucky. Um, but I'm able to go down and say hi and ask them how they're getting on. And I get the feeling that in our future endeavours, we're going to meet lots more exciting people um, who are at different stages in their, in their, in their business journey themselves. But... You know, those meetings might generate forward opportunities. Who knows? But it's a really exciting environment to be in. So whilst I came into it thinking I want to buy myself time through, you know, getting good cash flow for for, for myself and my family, I'm actually thinking that it's going to be a really exciting journey, and that's the way it's proven to be so far. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it, just the very nature, as you mentioned, you, you deal with so many different types of customers. They're all in different stages of their life cycle, their business. A lot of them are in growth, and that tends to be why they come to flexible space, because they want that ability to maybe change the size of space they're in. And it just, like you say, it just means there's a dynamic um, environment there with these people coming, growing, all that stuff that goes on. It is really, really interesting when you're in and amongst. As, as you grow, of course, and you build your portfolio, those opportunities to, to, to know your customers so closely become less because you're more in that operational kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but even still, you, you still get a bit of satisfaction from the fact that customers are able to grow their businesses um, and not all down to you, but certainly, you know, you have a you have a slight influence on that, you know, on the fact that they're succeeding and they're growing and just trying to make those connections and things for them and trying to help them build that network and all those things that you've been talking about. It, it's it's all it's it's all about hospitality, right? Comes back to that. Yeah, and I think that, that aspect is going to be a lot of fun as we try to seek new ways to improve the business, new ways to add value for the customer, which actually you know, could just be about giving them an opportunity to get together. I mean, that's a fairly obvious one, but developing that in some ways and opening up new possibilities for them. So it's uh, it's great fun, I have to say. Good. Now, I have to ask, Stephen, 
um, because we're just about at the end of the pod- podcast here. I just need to ask you, um, we, we've been working together on um, the mastermind uh, in commercial property investors. I just wondered if there was anything you could say about that, anything that you've learned or people you've met or any, anything that's come from that program that you felt has been beneficial? Okay, well, um, so we meet once a month and then we have an intermediate fortnightly deal club. Um, so that's been, it's been really useful. And in terms of sharing information, as we touched on previously, in the Mastermind programme, what's been interesting is that they're all people who are starting out in their commercial property journey. So they're at different stages. Some have got a SaaS set up that they need to invest. Some are looking for their way out already to, to, to find um, some positive cash flow for themselves. And they're all at different stages looking at different types of project. But that's opened up um, the thought process for me in so many different markets that I didn't think I might want to be interested in. So it's been really useful so far, and it's been great to meet the people involved. And we actually have now been lucky enough to be able to go on site and see, um, meet everybody and have a look around a few few operations of of, of yours, which was fantastic um, at their different stages as well. So, you know, it's been massively beneficial to me in in the time that we've been doing it so far. And uh, I'm sure there are a few more nuggets that you've got up your sleeve yet. <laughs> Appreciate that, Stephen. Yeah, <laughs> I learned so much though working with you guys. It really is. It's is a dual benefit there, definitely. Okay. So, Stephen, where where can people follow you? Follow what you're up to. If anybody wants to just have a, a check in and look at your your property and also just your your journey as you're going through this process. Okay. So our um website for Hive Workspaces is at www.hivescotland.co.uk. We're on Facebook at Hive Offices. We are on Instagram at Hive underscore work underscore spaces. And if anyone wants to reach out to me, they can get me at my email address, which is Stephen McKenzie at me.com. That's Stephen with a PH. Fantastic. Thanks, Stephen. We will put all that in the show notes. So anybody who didn't get that, you can just dive straight down there into the notes. You'll be able to connect up with Stephen if you want to see how he's getting on. It is a fabulous building. It's challenging on a podcast, of course. We're trying to describe it. You can't see it. So jump on um, Stephen's um, website there or on Instagram and have a look at the building. It really is a, a great space. And we're looking forward to seeing what the next project is, Stephen. Thanks so much for joining me today. Um, I think that having your experience that you've gone through in the last few months to be able to share with um, listeners is a really great thing. I really appreciate you taking time to do that because it, it just gives them that little bit of a nudge, a little bit of a look in to see what happens as you go through the process. So thank you so much for coming and joining us today, Stephen. Real, it's been a real pleasure. Privilege. Yeah, thanks very much. And if anyone does want to reach out, I'd be happy to answer any questions or, you know, help if I can. But it's been a to be here with you. See you soon. Brilliant. Thanks, Stephen.